Thank you for coming to this lecture uh, today. We're going to talk about the biology of ageing, right, which is a topic that myself and some other researchers in the biosciences department at Kent, as well as a whole community of scientists worldwide, are interested in. Okay. And it's something that most, most of you will also have a vested interest in because you yourselves will age and you will know lots of people at different ages. And it doesn't just, it's not a process that only happens to humans, it also happens in other species. And here we have the honeybee. At the centre is the queen bee, who lives for around about six years, whereas her workers only live for about six weeks. So within this one population that has exactly the same genetic background, there's a huge discrepancy in the amount of time that an individual can live for. So what scientists are interested in, in bees and in other species, is trying to find what it is, what are the differences between those that are living for a long time and those that are not, and trying to use these to understand the ageing process and perhaps trying to find ways that we can intervene in it. So back to humans now for a moment. This is a picture of my son with his dad and his granddad and his great granddad. And he was lucky enough to meet his great-granddad, which not everyone is. And this is because his great-granddad lived till he was 96, but he lived a very happy and very healthy life, which is the most important thing, at least in my opinion. And I think Opa Pals here is an example of what, how most people would like to age. They would like to be, they would like to live as long as they are independent and healthy and happy. And that's what we try and do as ageing researchers. We're not interested in just trying to indiscriminately make everyone live for hundreds and hundreds of years in a decrepit state. What we want to do is we really want to do away with a portion, this portion of ill life that a lot of elderly people suffer at the end of their lives. Okay. And instead, you know, we want to improve the amount of time that people are healthy during their lifespan. right? And as a result of that, there may well be a number of years that are added to the end of life. Okay? But hopefully most of these will be healthy ones. And there are examples in nature that make us think that this could be possible. Because there are actually species that don't seem to age at all. And this is one of those. This is a freshwater hydra. Okay? It's really quite beautiful. You see it floating around in the water. Right? Tiny little thing. But if scientists isolate populations of this species from the wild, which presumably would have a whole range of different ages in them, and then they take these populations into the lab, they don't seem to age at all. And they, a few of them die, but really they seem to go on for a very long time. Okay, so there's something about this process of ageing that doesn't mean that it happens, has to happen. So as well as this hydra, scientists tend to study a range of other different species. And this is because ageing studies in humans tend to be very long and often quite expensive to do. So what scientists do is they use model organisms. So this can range from the baker's yeast. So this is the same yeast that's used for making bread and for brewing beer. It's called Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It's a very basic organism. But we also use C. elegans, which is a nematode worm. The fruit fly, which can be found on any fruit bowl. Right. This is Drosophila melanogaster. And then you've got the mouse, Mus musculus. Okay. And there are a number of advantages to using these organisms. And one of the main ones is that we know their whole genome. Their genomes have all been sequenced. Right. So we can do really good genetics on them. And the populations of each one of these is homogenous, right? which again, when you're dealing with humans, there's much more variety to contend with. It's much faster to do ageing experiments in these organisms. Right? So for example, a worm will only live for three weeks and a fly for about three months. Right? It also makes these experiments a lot cheaper to do in the lab. But the important thing to remember is that all of these species, what we learn in these species can be related to humans. Because lots of the genes and lots of the pathways that scientists are studying are the same in these organisms as they are in humans. 
So I'm going to give you one example now from my own research, and this is the, the nematode worm, Sonora habditis elegans, or C. elegans for short. And here you can see it crawling around. This is a picture from the lab. And it crawls around in bacteria. That's what it grows on. In the wild, you can find it in compost, composting fruit. But in the lab, we grow it on small agar plates, which have been seeded with a little bit of E. coli bacteria. The worms crawl around in that quite happily. The biggest one that you can see here in the middle is an adult. And it's now producing eggs. And it's a hermaphrodite, so it produces both the eggs and the sperm, which self-fertilise to go on to produce embryos. And during its lifetime, it's going to lay around about 300 embryos over about five days. Okay, so you get a lot of worms very fast. And then these eggs, they're laid onto the plate and they hatch and they develop through three larval stage, four larval stages until they become adults themselves again and start the reproductive cycle all over. There are around about 20,000 protein coding genes in the worm. Okay, so this means the genes that we know what protein is, um, it, it, they encode for. Right? Um, and these have been mapped to a lot of different pathways, which are conserved through from um, worms all the way up to mammals in a lot of cases. These animals only live for three weeks, so I can do an experiment in the lab in under a month uh, for, to find out the effect of something on ageing. And they come with a really good toolkit, especially for genetics. It's possible to knock out genes in these this worm and it's possible to increase the expression of genes in these worms. Okay, so you can actually look at the detailed function of individual, individual genes. And of these 20,000 protein coding genes that it has, about 75% of them are similar to genes that are found in humans. So they live for about three weeks. But after the reproductive part of their life is over, so that first five days of adulthood, what happens to them? Well, they kind of crawl around on the plate a bit. They start to slow down. And if you start to look at them really carefully, you can actually look at lots of markers of aging. And some of these are um, muscle degeneration or fat accumulating in their, in their body wall muscle. Their skin gets a bit thicker. You can see that their food, the bacteria, starts to clog up their, their gut and slow down their digestive system. Their neurons branch and they form tumours in their, in their uterus. Um, and also you have some accumulation of yolk from the embryos in the intestine as well. So let's have a look at the video. And on the left we have a young worm. You can see it's crawling around the plate really happily. And on the, on the right is an old worm. So when you prod it with a worm pick, it's what we call the tool that we the scientists use to manipulate these animals. If you prod it, it barely moves at all. It actually looks a bit dead in this picture, but I can assure you that it's not. It's alive. I looked at it very carefully under the microscope. Okay, but this just gives you an idea of what we're looking at. But what we do is we generate lifespan data. So we generate lifespan curves, we call them, right? So we start with a population of around about 100 worms on a plate. And every day, or every two or three days, we look at them and we determine whether each one is dead or alive by poking it with that worm pick. Right? And that's what each point on this graph is. Okay? So every day, we figure out the percentage of worms that is alive. So for quite a long time at the beginning, everybody's alive in that population. Nobody dies. But then at some point in the middle, it starts to drop off pretty fast. Okay? So WT stands for wild type, which is a normal worm. Okay, so this is a normal worm's lifespan, with an average of around about three weeks. Okay. But then what we do is, because we're trying to understand the genes that are involved in this process, is we start playing around with the worm's genome, and we start making genetic mutations. Okay. And this is a repeat, a repeat of an experiment that was done by Cynthia Kenyon in the early 90s, which really kick-started the ageing field, particularly in C. elegans. Okay, and what she did was she made a point mutation in a gene called DAF2. Okay, and she found 
the, with the worms that carried this one mutation, so this is one tiny change in their genome, lived for twice as long okay, as those that were pretty much normal, that didn't have this mutation. Okay. And she found that if you also, if you combine this mutation with another one called DAF16, this effect went away. Okay. And myself and others are extremely interested in trying to understand what it is about this genetic mutation and about this one here that relates to it that is actually responsible for this effect on lifespan. And one of the reasons for this is that this gene, this DAF2 gene, is actually the worm equivalent of the human insulin receptor. So it's, it's conserved, it's the same. There is an equivalent of DAF2 in flies and in mice and also in humans. Okay? And this one gene, which is a receptor gene, is at the top of a pathway, at the top of a, um, a signalling pathway. And the details of this are not important at the moment. This is something that you will learn about as you go through your undergraduate degree at Kent. But these pathways are conserved throughout these species. Okay. So what we learn in the worms about the role of this pathway in lifespan can also be applied to the flies, to the mice, and ultimately also to humans. And another really impressive thing about these long-lived worms, so these worms with this one genetic mutation in the DAF2 gene, is that not only are they living twice as long, but they're also incredibly healthy. They're moving really happily around the plate for a really long time into their lifespan, much longer than a normal worm. Okay, so they don't seem to be suffering from the muscle degeneration, something that could be related to human sarcopenia, and they're not, seem, they're not suffering from the accumulation of lipids in their body wall muscles. They're not getting as many tumours in their intestine, um, in their uterus. And their neurons aren't branching as much. Okay. And we can relate all of these things, or we can try to relate these things to the human ageing condition. So what we're doing, going back to the earlier point, is that what we're trying to do is not have this portion of ill health at the end of life, but not only ex but extend lifespan, and also increase the amount of time that an individual is healthy from. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>